In this series, lowimpact.org and the Open Credit Network talks with people working to build a mutually owned, democratic, decentralised economy that builds community and doesn't destroy nature. We want to increase collaboration to bring about system change. Find links to the sites mentioned in the videos in the description below. Join the conversation by liking, commenting and subscribing to our channel. The circular economy. I read your article criticizing the circular economy and I have to say I agreed with it. I looked at the, um, the platform for accelerating the circular economy's website and it's endorsed by major multinationals like Procter & Gamble and Shell and Nissan and Unilever. Now they all want to maximize profits at, and they all support economic growth. Um, and they really? seem to have forgotten that recycling takes energy. Um, yeah. And even renewable energy, you need factories producing the solar panels and trucks to deliver them and mines for the materials. Uh, and we can never recycle 100% of any material. Some is always lost. Uh, but the main point is it, it takes energy. So, you know, yeah. circular economy, great. Let's go towards the circular economy. But it's not the final answer. We, need, we can't do that within the constantly growing economy. Yeah, you're right in all of that. And, and in addition, you know, one of the things that I pointed out in that article is that, well, sure, we can strive for circular flows here and there, like maybe the aluminum sector. But once again, going back to the definition of economic growth and how it's goods and services in the aggregate, that makes us think a little harder about the structure of the economy. And, that, and I call it the triangular economy because at that broad base, are the uh, agricultural and extractive and energy pursuits that allow all the rest, all the, the manufacturing from the heaviest to the lightest, as well as the, uh, the service sectors. None of that exists without agricultural surplus that frees the hands for the division of labor. And, and there's no circularity there. You know, you're, we're using water and soil and energy to produce the food. There's a throughput of that nutrition in everybody on the planet. And yeah, these notions of circularity, uh, of a circular economy are, uh, you know, almost oxymoronic. Mm. They're certainly mis misleaded, uh, misleading and misguided. That's because, because we operate in green circles, um, we hear a lot about sustainable growth or green growth, uh, which drives me insane. Uh, it's such an oxymoron. And I don't know if you, have you come across Jason Hickel. Yeah, I've, I've seen uh, an occasional article and I, uh, occasional tweets. You know, <laughs> we try to do a little bit in social media. And so I, we have seen reference to uh, Jason Hickel. He's, I think, loosely affiliated with the degrowth movement in Europe or or writes about degrowth issues at times? He does some really great work. Yeah, he writes about um, studies that um, have shown that decoupling of GDP growth and resource use has never happened, and in fact, can't happen. It's impossible. He's, he's really, really good. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you know this. I mean, we, we passed the 100 billion tons mark for annual global extraction of raw resources from nature, like minerals and timber and fish. And only a few yeah. years ago, we were trying to keep it under 50 billion tons because that was considered the limit for sustainability. Mm -hmm. And people are struggling to work out what to do about it. And, and I just ask, why are you surprised if, job, if global GDP keeps rising? There's, there's no way to keep resource extraction under any kind of limit. It, it will just keep growing. Yes, totally agree. And that, that goes back to the triangular economy with the trophic base. You want GDP growth, you must expand that base free more hands for more division of labor, including the research and development, the R&D sector. And so, yeah, and that, that expanding base, that amounts to increasing environmental impact, and mm. increasing uh, deterioration of our planetary ecosystem. Right, I came across this decoupling idea about 20 years ago and I applied for some govern government funding. They, they provided information with the funding application that said the UK had decoupled nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide emissions from GDP growth. And now they were going for carbon. Uh, and they linked to a study. So I looked into it and they didn't include the emissions from goods that we consume that aren't made in this country, which is almost everything. <laughs> and so wow. we've ex exported the emissions. We haven't stopped them. 
It's our demand that's causing the emissions. And plus, they didn't include emissions from flights in and out of the country or cargo ships in and out of the country because those emissions didn't happen in, in our country, which is just blatant cheating. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a really pathetic study. <laughs> yeah. So, so for me, green growth is just impossible. And, um, yeah, and, it's an oxymoron. And yet it's, it's part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And lots of greenies support that. But one of the goals is distinctly economic growth. And so, well, yeah. Well, Dave, going back to your earlier question about how tough this challenge is to get over the growth hump, if you will, uh, recognizing that the UN champions this notion of green growth. When you think about political economy, we're swimming upstream, a rapid river of political economy. And we are making progress, like I mentioned before. Ban Ki, I, I should mention that this will encourage people. Ban Ki-moon came this close, literally. Here's the clipboard, here's the pen. That close to signing the Cassie position on economic growth. Wow. Yes, about two months ago at the National Geographic Auditorium. Um, and what stopped him? His entourage, his, oh, his bodyguards, they ushered, they wanted him to move uh, more right quickly. Right. But he gave a nice response. Uh, we questioned him in the open forum after his talk, and he, he basically agreed. So, you know, we do have uh, key international figures that get it, but they're sort of, they're also in that river of political economy, and they're kind of stuck for a while yet, evidently, with growth stuff, mm. rhetorically, at least. And have you uh, come across Jevons' paradox? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so that's... Um... It's very explanatory, and I, it's a nice, uh, I was going to say metaphor, but it's more than metaphor. It's a microeconomic uh, example that Jevons wrote about in the 18, around 1870 or so with the coal question. Yeah. That really applies macroeconomically as well. Yeah. You can get more and more efficient, like we were talking about before, through research and development, but all the while you're using more and more stuff, and that, that reflects the trophic structure, the triangular economy, where you had to have at the base more and more extraction and agricultural surplus to free those hands for yeah. more and more efficient I was very surprised when I came across Jevons Paradox for the first time. It was several years ago now, but um, it just doesn't make sense when you first hear it. That if you, if, you, if you have a technology that reduces the amount of a particular resource that is required to, do, to, to produce the same amount of stuff, uh, that will, it won't reduce the amount of that resource that's used. It will increase the amount of resource, that, and that doesn't make any sense. And Jevons based that on... Um, on coal use, didn't he, with the with James Watts steam engine? So, like, oh, we can do the same amount of work with much less coal. So, therefore, we're going to save lots of coal. But of course, it just made the economy boom, and loads more coal was used. Obviously, there was the you know massive boost in the industrial revolution. Yeah, Jevons paradox. It's not paradoxical to us at Cassie, yeah. or I, I would hope to the broader community in ecological macroeconomics. Mm. Because it takes investment, heavy inv by now, heavy, heavy investment just to raise the bar a little more because all the, the easily garnished natural capital has been liquidated by long ago. And so now, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of investment. And I keep going back to this, but what's required for that heavier and heavier investment? More and more surplus at the base of the economy to free those hands for all that that additional R&D. So the CEOs of large corporations, they would be ousted, wouldn't they, if they didn't maximize return to shareholders. So how can we even address corporate executives about not constantly trying to grow their companies? Why would they listen? Well, so I'll use the American example for a moment, which Right now, in probably in the history of the world, would be the, wor the least expected place where we can overcome the problem you just mentioned. But right now, yes. Uh, <laughs> the, we, in the United States, our government operates pursuant 
to a constitution, right? And the American constitution, we've looked at it pretty carefully. We feel it is entirely conducive to a steady state economy. Yes, it establishes, loosely speaking, a capitalist democracy, but the capitalism part is by no means the emphasis of the founding fathers. It's the democratic part that's the emphasis. So if you look at the capitalist democracy like a horse and rider, we need a strong enough, smart enough democratic rider on that capitalist horse. And that translates to good, solid public policies that the majority favor and get enacted through their elected officials to do things like put a cap on, on energy consumption. And that, that amounts to an evening of the playing field from the top, if you will, for the rest of the corporate community. Yeah, they'll still strive to maximize those, uh, you know, the returns to shareholders. But there, if there is a cap, it's kind of like a salary cap in a sports league. You can't spend more. And then, it's a, then the competition is that much tighter below that to succeed. Hey, that's okay. They're, they boasted for, for, you know, eons about, oh, competition's great. Competition's great. Let's have the competition under the cap. Yeah, so, so, so that's a very interesting point about capitalism because – I would imagine without without capital accumulation and without debt based money with interest if you rem if you removed or either of those two things so so for me they they absolutely guarantee growth but if you remove them you wouldn't have capitalism anymore it's sort of really I always think in terms of a of post capitalism of a new kind of economy which doesn't which is not based on capital accumulation or, or debt-based money. Um, yeah. I can't well, see how capitalism as a, as a system can stabilize. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine with me. I mean, uh, we, but we do have to realize that term capitalism is, there's, in addition to the techniques of it and, and the history behind the use of the there is a tremendous amount of semantics. You know, there's the old American country singer, Merle Haggard, who passed away a couple years ago. But what did he say in that one song? There's like, there's uh, all kinds of mothers and there's nine kinds of cats. <laughs> These terms that get used, they have many, and capitalism is the king of all, I would say. Yeah. Different combinations and permutations of, uh, of connotation. People understand different things. I mean, we're, we're working on um, a mutual credit network, which doesn't involve money. It's just everybody, businesses have an account and they just trade with each other on account. Doesn't require money. Uh, so that could be the basis of a non-growing economy. And people, uh, they, they, a lot of people relate to us in, in, in terms of, I don't really understand. If, you, if it's not capitalism, then it must be communism. And it's like, as though there's no other alternative. It's like, no, 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 not at all. It, actually, it's a completely free market. It's, it's a freer market than capitalism, in fact. There's no sort of yeah. government allowing corporations to avoid their taxes while clamping down on small businesses. None of that. It's a completely level playing field. Uh, so, yeah, I, I do get this. A lot of people think that you're a Stalinist if you question capitalism. But, yeah, uh, that is... That is very frustrating. Yeah. It's ridiculous and frustrating. And some of that I, I feel is like it's planted, it's programmed out. It's part of the PR campaign of Wall Street and, you know, the European counterparts to or, uh, build a straw man of those of us concerned about sustainability and just label us communist. In the U.S., you get labeled socialist. I guess in Europe, you know, where there's plenty of socialist uh party history and and so on you get labeled a communist <laughs> yeah there's yeah a, but i mean it's, it's either it, one either or you get labeled it doesn't have to be statist at all i mean and anyway the old communist countries and china now they grow more than capitalist countries anyway so obviously a, a steady stater is not going to be in favor of communism because it's absolutely packed full of growth Absolutely. And the Cold War, people so easily forget about the Cold War. It was a, a, a race in, in which the score was kept with GDP. 
that's what the Cold War was all about. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not whether it's capitalism or socialism or con- it's about what the macroeconomic goal is for GDP. Mm. You know, you I and I do say again, I think the American Constitution is perfectly suited to uh, to host, if you will, a steady state economy, and and does and would be very useful in international diplomacy for uh, steady state economics too. And what what are your um, what are your ambitions? Well, we have. Uh, on the legislative front, we have the Full and Sustainable Employment Act for the USA in mind. Um, the central economic policy of the United States, especially in macroeconomics, is the Employment Act. It's passed in 1946, and there weren't any really major amendments until 1978. There haven't been any since. And, uh, but in 1978, Congress, in its wisdom, got the Fed involved in the growth game, got the American government uh, pushing formally for GDP growth. So we want to reverse that, and, and uh, I think it would make it fairly clear with the new title, Full and Sustainable Employment Act, that uh, the central policy of it all would be the long-term goal of a steady state that's and what's our what, biggest ambition on the legislature? And what are the what are the Go next ahead, what are the next steps towards that? What's top of your agenda at the moment? Well, I should say we have a zillion different projects going on at the moment, and they jockey for priority depending upon the COVID nineteen put everything on hold pretty much for a while and has us uh, responding to that, writing articles, uh, communicating with our network about the right kind of messaging and so forth. But, uh, but the Full and Sustainable Employment Act is clearly our long-term legislative priority. We're not gonna get it passed in this Congress or the next Congress. We're hoping for 15, 20 years down the road to get it passed. There'll be a lot of environment that will have been destroyed by then, a lot of jobs permanently lost because the environmental base needed to support those jobs will be gone. But, you know, it's better late than never. And so we're pushing uh, for the full and sustainable employment. Uh, On the international front, we have projects like the one I mentioned with Uganda, uh, our involvement with the Harmony with Nature initiative, uh, out of Bolivia and, and a few other things, but similar to the Full and Sustainable Employment Act within the U.S., uh, we have in mind a Convention on Economic Sustainability, and this is the convention that would kick off steady statesmanship. Right now, I, I guess I, I can also mention we have a designed, naturally enough, I guess, given my background with the Endangered Species Act, we have a designed similarly to that in the sense that the Convention on Economic Sustainability would come out of the Full and Sustainable Employment Act, kind of like CITES, the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna, comes out of Section 8, I think it was, of the Endangered Species Act. So, you know, an act of Congress can, can establish internal policy, interior policy, and it can also direct the government in uh, diplomatic endeavors as well. What, what are the biggest barriers standing in your way at the moment? Well, the river of political economy, you know, it's tough for us to get, frankly, funding to maintain a, a decent staff. Uh, and so we depend a lot on volunteer effort and, and uh, these things. We're certainly not alone in that regard. Um, Barriers in the more conventional sense, well, uh, Wall Street, of course, and and neoclassical economics is still, in academia, it's still pumping out economists that are trained around that landless production function and that think, contrary to our assessments, that, that you can dematerialize the economy and have green growth. So that's that's a major barrier yet. But that we see that barrier crumbling pretty rapidly now. 
And so that, I'm not too worried about them anymore. I do get the impression that more people are getting it. I, 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 you know, 20 years ago, I talked to people about this and people just looked, as, looked at you as if you're mad. Uh, but now, quite a lot of people, they just take it as red. Well, of course you can't have a perpetually growing economy on a finite planet of, unless you want to become extinct. Of course you can't. Yeah. Um, and I'm really surprised at how many people get it now. So, so maybe, yeah, there's a, a seedling growing there. I what, think so. What do you think, um, what, what's your most important message? What, what can people do if they, if they want to help, if they want to get involved, if they, if, they, you know, if they think that you're right, what can they do? You know, everybody's different. So I would say go to our website, steadstate.org, and look around. There are all kinds of opportunities to get involved or alternatively not to get involved, but just to help you know, make a donation, of course. I'm not very good at, at uh, asking for donations, but maybe this is my chance. Please donate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sign, but sign the Cassie position on economic growth, of course, because those signatures really do count, like I mentioned before. They impress and they empower politicians to tell it like it is about minutes to growth. Uh, please join Cassie. That's a, that's a different thing than just signing the position. Uh, students can join Cassie for $10 and a regular membership fee is $25. And we'll send you a free copy of a really nice little primer that we publish called uh, Best of the Daily News, D-A-L-Y, after the leading steady state economist from the daily. Yeah. It's a, it's a nice little primer. I've got his book somewhere here. Oh, okay. It was. Uh, it really influenced me. That book. I read it years ago. Oh, okay. But now this is a new one, Dave. This is called Best of the Daily News. It's the thirty-three best what we considered out of a collection of three hundred and three uh, articles that we published from approximately two thousand eight to twenty eighteen. So the ten-year period. Um, uh, on on our blog, which at the time we called the Daily News, you know, after Herman. Yeah. So we had Herman, uh, Brent Blackwelder, uh, myself, uh, Rob Dietz, uh, and we had great guest authors like James Magnus Johnston and uh, the late Eric Zensi. Um, and we have articles by these folks in Best of the Daily News. It's a really nice little primer. Five star reviews completely so far. So uh, we'll send okay, a we'll, copy of that to Cassie. We'll get that on our yeah. books page. We'll, get, we'll, uh, we'll sell that on our books page. And um, very happy to reblog articles from the Daily News as well. And we'll, we'll, continue, to, uh, we'll continue to send people your way, I hope. Um, and I'd love to talk to you as, more about different ways that we might be able to work together. Okay, and you know, there is one more thing I forgot. We're looking right now for additional material for our blog, which is now uh, called the Steady State Herald. Uh, we've traditionally had one article per month. We want two, and we're going to a daily, D-A-I-L-Y. We want a daily publication. So we need more, authors. they gotta be good solid authors. Uh, that send us material that's just about ready to go, taking very little editing, 1,000 to 2,000 words. And uh, yeah, that is another way that people can help. I, I, the, I, I, the articles I, must be very, very relevant to limits to growth, the conflict between growth and other things, uh, the need for a steady state economy, uh, steady statesmanship and international diplomacy, the degrowth movement, uh, the, the nonsensicality of, of green growth and decoupling, these types, this type of material. I think we, we'll, we've got some articles I'll send to you to have a look at, and, um, and I'll put okay. the word out to ask other people if, if, they, if they would like to contribute. Wonderful. Um, all right then, Brian. It's been wonderful talking with you. You too, Dave. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work there. And Thank you very much, and you. All right. Take care. Cheers, Brian.